What motivates someone to be a spy? George Gorbachev is a fascinating Soviet spy, partly because he's Red Army military trained intelligence officer, and because he was born and raised in Iowa. My name is Anne Hagedorn, and my most recent book is Sleeper Agent, the Atomic Spy in America Who Got Away. The story of George Koval is like something out of the Americans. You're going to have to make a decision to commit to this life or to get out. It's not easy, and it doesn't always end well. Koval was a Soviet spy living and working in the United States. He stole top secret information and no one ever suspected him. One of the great traits of Koval, what made him blend in so well into American culture was that he had grown up in Iowa. Koval was born in Sioux City on Christmas Day, 1913 to Russian Jewish immigrant parents. He graduated from high school at the age of 15, very bright guy. The 1920s and 30s saw a spike in anti-Semitism in the U.S. with the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and other racist campaigns. The Kovals wanted out and decided to return to Russia. They left in 1932 to return to the Soviet Union because the new Russia, after the Russian Revolution, had made anti-Semitism illegal and then was welcoming Jews to come to what was called the Jewish Autonomous Region. Bringing their three children was to escape anti-Semitism and to participate in the communist ideal of ending world oppression. Koval studied chemistry at a Russian institute. Eventually, he was recruited by Soviet intelligence. And while his family members would never return to the U.S., George did as a sleeper agent. A sleeper agent is a spy who blends into the target country. But what's very interesting is the immense training that goes into creating a sleeper agent. And for George Koval, the training period was probably less than usual because he was already part of the American culture. So he must have been a gem in the eyes of the Red Army military intelligence. He loved baseball. He was a skilled shortstop. He could reel off the history and stats of every big league pitcher. He played bridge. He was a reader. He read poetry. He read Walt Whitman, Longfellow. He could actually recite poems from those American poets. And he was quite the ladies' man. He obviously blended in quite well. He just fit into the American culture. And so he did when he returned to the U.S. in 1940. He took science classes at Columbia University and played his role to the hilt. It a self-designed tapestry of lies and half-truths, and he didn't mingle with members of the Communist Party USA. He didn't mingle with people who believed as he did in some of the communist ideals. He belonged to a bowling league. He belonged to an honorary fraternity for electrical engineers. So he really knew how to blend in. The Army and the administration say, we need manpower now, and here's the response. Koval enlisted in the U.S. Army. He was able to test into a special technical program, and that led to his being posted at two of the important research centers for the Manhattan Project, America's Atomic Bomb Program. Possibly the greatest scientific advance in all of man's history took place at Alamogordo, New Mexico, on the morning of July 16, 1945. He worked as a health physicist. He knew what was happening at these highly secretive sites. He had access to every facility, every plant in the two sites of Oak Ridge and Dayton. And health physicists had to learn the basic chemical properties of all the radioactive materials they were monitoring. Think about that. They were asked to be present 
uh, whenever repair work was done on any equipment at any of the plants and no shipment could leave Oak Ridge or Dayton without the approval of the health physicists. He had access to all offices and labs. He even had a Jeep. So here he was, a U.S. Army corporal who had been trained as a spy in the Soviet Union. He was a Red Army intelligence officer and he had all of this access. Koval relayed intelligence back to the Soviet Union and changed the course of the Cold War. Koval sent information about polonium the fuel, the essential fuel for the trigger of the atomic bomb. He sent a lot of details about radiation safety. And toward the end of the research and the building of the atomic bomb, the Soviet atomic bomb, that became more crucial than ever because they didn't want to lose any of the experts. Did that quicken the development of the Soviet atomic bomb? Of course it did, because what we did took a while to experiment. You, you know, you eliminated all of the experiments if you were receiving this information. What he sent to the Soviet Union quickened their development of an atomic bomb. Their big test was in August of 1949. And that was very quick. 50% of what the Soviets knew about the atomic bomb came from espionage. Koval was never detected. He fled the U.S. in 1948, returning to his family in the Soviet Union. His identity as a Soviet spy was only discovered in 1954. By then, he had secured a teaching job at an institute near Moscow. He died there in 2006 at the age of 92. A year and a half after he passed away, Vladimir Putin gave him a posthumous award called the Hero of the Federation, a very uh, high level award. Towards the end of his life, a colleague asked Koval if he had any regrets about what he had done. He told Arnold he had no regrets. This is Inside Edition Digital.